Go ahead and be seated. Turning your Bibles, please, to the book of First Corinthians. I love starting a new book of the Bible. We're going to be in here for a while. How many chapters are in First Corinthians? Don't raise your hand, or don't say it out loud. Just raise your hand if you know how many chapters are in First Corinthians. You're looking, you're looking, you're looking right now, aren't you? You should know. You should know. There are 16. Way to go, Tom. Excellent. Anybody else got a better guess? No, it's, 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 it's 16. I don't, have, I don't have candy. I have eye drops. You want my eye drops? I'll, I'll, I'll come on down. I owe you. I will not forget as long as you remind me, right? Yeah, we're starting 1 Corinthians uh, this morning. And where we're going to start first, well, let's do this. Just as a reminder, when we start a new book of the Bible, uh, bring a Bible to church. Bring a Bible to church. Bring a Bible to church. Okay? I love these, but this is not a Bible. Okay? This is a phone with a Bible app. Because you can take notes and write in your Bible. It'll be so much easier for you to... uh, to find when you are doing your own personal Bible study. Whenever we uh, start a new book of the Bible, three reminders, always bring a Bible, always bring a, uh, a journal or a notepad, and, uh, and bring a pen or a pencil or a crayon, whatever you, your writing implement of choice would be, because we go through a lot of information in a very short amount of time. And the goal is not just to come in here on a Sunday morning or on a Wednesday night and study the Word together for an hour and then to not remember anything that you learned. I mean, how how many of you remember some of the key points even from last week? Might be hard, right? But if you are discussing that during lunch or during dinner or over the next few days, It's going to be pegged in long-term memory, so I'm encouraging you to do that. And if you're here this morning and you don't have a Bible, we've got uh, some men in the back that will bring you one to follow along. We're going to be going through the first 11 verses this morning in 1 Corinthians. Does anybody need a Bible? Just slip up your hand. We'll make sure we get one to you. Look how well we're training you, right? Nobody needs a Bible. I love that. I love that. Okay, now that you've got your finger there or your Bible ribbon or a bookmark there, in 1 Corinthians 1, I want you to turn to 2 Peter, 2 Peter chapter 1. When it comes to growing in spiritual maturity, a few years back, we had this as one of our memory verses. This was one of our memory verses. This is, this is 2 Peter chapter 1, verses 5 through 8. It says, but also for this very reason, you can say it with me, for this very reason, giving all diligence, what's that word there? Add, right? Add to your faith virtue, to virtue knowledge, to knowledge self-control, to self-control perseverance, to perseverance godliness, to godliness brotherly kindness, and to brotherly kindness love. For if these things are yours and abound, you will neither be barren nor unfruitful in the knowledge of our Lord Jesus Christ. Constantly, we should be adding to our spiritual growth continuously, continuously. So, being exhorted to constantly be adding to our faith, the question often comes up, how do we evaluate? How do you? Congregation participation time, how do you evaluate your own personal spir- spiritual growth or, or those in your family or, or friends? How do you evaluate those things? What do you use? What's your barometer? What's your measuring stick? It's awful quiet out there. Just raise your hand. What do you got, Bill? Yeah, if you are exercising the fruit of the Spirit, love, joy, peace, long-suffering or patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, self control. Is that your default or are those things seen rarely? Okay, give me another one. How are you measuring your spiritual growth? Okay, right here, Justin. Yeah, how much time you are actually 
spending with God in His Word. Very good. All right. What's another one? Okay, Kathy. Retention? Retention? Water retention? No, no. Retention of God's, God's spiritual water, living water, right? Very good, very good. Okay, what else? How do you measure if you are growing in your faith? How do you know if you're adding to your faith virtue and knowledge? How do you know? Attila. Based on your actions? Based on your behavior. And, and, and we are very gracious with, with, uh, with measuring our own spiritual growth. So ask those who are closest to you if you are really growing in Christ. For me, God quickly reveals my spiritual maturity in very practical and tangible and visible ways. And one of those ways is how I deal with my weekly trip to Walmart. <laughs> my weekly adventure to Walmart after 15 minutes of dealing with all the SMPs. You know what an SMP is, right? Slow-moving people. Okay, I can't stand that. I get to the checkout line. I'm in the 20 item or less. They don't always have those now, but remember those. And the lady in front of me, 23 items. <laughs> lady, it says 20. You've got 23. And don't get all pious on me like you have never counted how many things that people have. Have you, have you ever done it? Have you ever done it? How many of you just lied in church? Okay. And to make matters worse, she doesn't even practice the proper grocery line etiquette and place that little plastic divider, it's there for a reason, between her groceries and the next person coming up so that you can start putting your stuff uh, on there. And, you know, or what, what, what do you do? Are you, are you tempted to call, call security? No, you can't do that. Or are you just thankful, thankful to Jesus that you are able to purchase the last bag of Cool Ranch Doritos, <laughs> right? What bums you out? What do you allow to steal your joy? That is a good way to measure your spiritual growth. And after you've waited in line for 10 minutes, all your items have been scanned, you're mere milliseconds away from getting out of Wally World, right? And on to something productive, as the cashier goes to give you your receipt, what happens? The register runs out of... Raise your hand if that has ever happened to you. You've ever won that lottery. Yeah, okay, that's always great. Cashier hits her little, her little light, calls out manager, right? And you look at all those people behind you in line, and, and you smile only to see that they are not smiling. They are glaring, and they're glaring at you like this is your fault, like you just, you know, tried to write a, a bad check or something like that. And the manager changes the tape, gives you the receipt. I jet out of there as fast as I can, as like, uh, fast, like, like Honey Boo Boo chasing after a cheeseburger, that fast, right? Some of you don't even remember who Honey Boo Boo is, right? And I do that so all the mad people, you know, can't follow me out to my car. In those situations, right, in those situations, how do you deal with that? Do you think that's a fair way to measure your spiritual maturity? Are you, you know, I, I shared last week about another way to measure our spiritual maturity is every time we get behind a wheel of a car, how you doing there? Love, joy, peace, long suffering. How's that working with you? I've driven behind some of you. I've, you don't know that, huh? Oh, uh, yeah, like I don't like pastors don't have eyes. Okay, yeah, I've, I've seen that. What do your actions reveal about how you handle the simple things in life? Do you respond with anger or do you respond with gratitude? Which is your default? Because that will tell you if you are maturing in Christ or, uh, or, uh, or not. Write this down. This would be good for you to write down. Take lots of notes today. Our faith is revealed in our actions, and growing in Christ is not an event. It's a daily process. It's a daily process. When was the last time that you sat down with the Holy Spirit and you asked Him, where am I growing spiritually? You should make a list. You should do that. He's talking to you. He talks to us primarily through His Word. 
When was the last time that you asked the Lord, Lord, how did I do today? How, how did I represent you today? Did I, do I get an A++? Do I get a little smiley face? I gave Don a little smiley face sticker a little earlier. She's wearing, do you have it on? Donna, you have your sticker still on or did you take it off? It's right there, a little smiley face. Because she did what she, uh, she'd been asked to do. So I gave her a little sticker. I usually give them to the kids. And Donna's just a bigger kid. So I, I, uh, I gave it to her. We have to remember this. It is faith alone that saves, but faith, uh, but faith that is real is never alone. True faith changes our hearts. And if our hearts are changed, our behavior is changed. See, it's out of the abundance of what? The heart that the, that the mouth speaks. It's out of the abundance of the heart that your behavior then goes out. As we embark on this verse, uh, verse by verse study in 1 Corinthians, Apostle Paul is going to remind us that even church people who have been taught well, do you think that the Apostle Paul could say that he taught people well? Do you think so? I think so. I think so. But he's going to show us here through 1 Corinthians that even people that have been taught well don't always put into application what they've been taught. And before we, before we dive right into uh, to 1 Corinthians, I want to give you a little bit of overview. And I encourage you, do some of your own Bible study on this church at Corinth. I want to give some basic info on the, uh, on the city. Corinth is in southern Greece. It's about 50 miles east or west of Athens. You're correct. It is west. It is west. From what we understand, according to Acts 18, that's what we did on Wednesday night. We read through Acts 18. Paul had traveled to Corinth to spread the gospel on his second missionary journey. He spent 18 months investing in these precious people. He intended to come back to Corinth on his third missionary journey, yet he ended up spending how many years in Ephesus? Do you remember? Yeah, he spent three years. He spent three years in Ephesus planting the church there. So it appears that the church in Corinth, while waiting for Paul to return, they had some questions. They wrote him a letter. They had questions, including questions about sexual immorality in the church. So they wrote to Paul, and he answered those questions in a letter, a letter that we do not have. And we believe that there was a letter because Apostle Paul, when we get to, uh, when we get to uh, chapter 5, when we get to chapter 5 of 1 Corinthians, he's going to say this in verse 9, I wrote to you uh, in my epistle not to keep company with the sexually immoral people. So that means that Paul had written a previous letter. Thus, what we are reading here in 1 Corinthians, as we know it, is really what? 2 Corinthians. Very good. It's his second letter to those in Corinth. Now, the, the people of Corinth had a very special place in Paul's heart. He loved them, and he traveled there at least three times. Paul's First visit was in about 50 A.D. Are you writing these things down? Are you writing these things down, Bible students? These are going to help you. You can write them down in your Bible. You can write them down on your notepad, but it will help you. He traveled there at least three times. The first time in about 50 A.D., according to Acts 18. He went to Corinth again sometime after he wrote 1 Corinthians, probably around 55. A.D., some five years later, according to 1 Corinthians 4, 19, and 1 Corinthians 16, 5 through 8. And we read about Paul going to Corinth again, third time, around 57 A.D., to invest in them. And we know this from 2 Corinthians 12, verse 14, and chapter 13, verse 1. Now, when we read about Paul's missionary journeys, we rarely think about how much area he covered to share the gospel. Are you looking at this map? Look at that. That's how much area the Apostle Paul covered. It appears that he covered maybe 
10,000 miles. 10,000 miles or, uh, or more to preach the good news. 10,000 miles, multiple continents, sometimes in terrible weather, all without uh, uh, an air-conditioned H2 Hummer Uber, right? All without Delta Airlines, all without a super yacht. Primarily, Paul did this on foot. He walked thousands of miles to share Jesus with other people. You picking up what I'm laying down here? You know what I'm going to say, right? What an encouragement for us to at least walk 50 feet to the neighbor's door and share the gospel with them. Have you shared the gospel with your neighbors? Who's your neighbor, right? Have you shared the gospel with your neighbors? I bet you probably have not. Why do you think you're in that neighborhood? Why has God planted you in that neighborhood? Do you look for opportunities? Oh, their garage door is open. I'm going to go over and talk to my neighbor. I, I, that's the way I think. There's people outside. I will make a reason to go to my mailbox at that particular time. If I see somebody that's walking their dog down the street, I'll do them I'm in my garage. And I'll see through the window. And I'll say, okay, if I time it just right, I can just nonchalantly kind of start to walk out right when they're walking by. Why do I do that? Because I believe in the Great Commission that God has given to all of us to go, therefore, and make disciples of all nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father, the Son, the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe everything that I command you, even to the end of the age. We all are commanded to do that. Remember I said one of the things, one of the six things, one of the six things that Turk people, church people off the most is when you exhort them to evangelism. It won't bother you if you're doing it. It only bothers you if you're not. You are here today because somebody shared the gospel with you. Oh. We are only one generation away, according to Judges 2. We're only one generation away from a godless generation. Every generation of believers is responsible for winning that generation to Christ. How are we doing? How are you measuring your faith there? Are you sharing the gospel on a regular basis? Or are you just thinking, oh, that's somebody else's job? So I'm just encouraging you, do, it. do what God says. That's what, look what the Apostle Paul did, because he believed. He believed in the good news. You know, we're, we're obviously exhorted, very simple. In Mark 16, 15, what's it say? What's it say? Go in all the world, and what? To everyone. To everyone, are you doing your share with the everyone's that, uh, that you know? In Acts 16, Paul gets the Macedonian call. He leaves Troas, travels across the sea to Philippi. He then goes to Thessalonica. He goes to Berea. He travels south to Athens, and then he goes to Corinth. Now, all these, city in the, all these cities in the Greek Empire, they were pagan, right? They were idolatrous cities. Corinth was even more pagan and more idolatrous than the other cities that were around them. Corinth was a huge city, second largest in the empire next to Athens, right? 400,000 people is what is estimated. Almost a half a million people in the city of Corinth. It's located on an isthmus. Hard word to say, right? On an isthmus. And... Uh, and it separates, you know, and this is just a narrow land bridge separating the majority of Greece from the uh, uh, Peloponnese Peninsula. I think I've got, yeah, which is, which is all of this. Let's see, where are we at? Corinth, okay, so we're up here. All of this is the Peloponnesian Peninsula, Athens right here, all those other cities, Philippi, Berea, Thessalonica, all of those are right up there. To the north. It was on a, on, a, on a major trade route, making it the perfect environment for thieves and crime and drunkenness and lewdness, debauchery and, and prostitution. The religion of Corinth was sex. 
with one of the primary pagan gods that they worshipped in Corinth was Aphrodite, the goddess of sex and pleasure, and it's located, located at the very top of this Acropolis up there. I've been there. It's, uh, it's quite a sight to behold. And what they did, what they did to finance the construction and the upkeep of this temple is that they would send out a thousand women every night. They would do this. They would send out a, women to, uh, a thousand women to, to partake in the world's oldest profession. And, and they were referred to as shrine priestesses. But what would we refer to them? They were shrine prostitutes, right? That's all they were. Even in the culture of that day, the known world knew that the city of Corinth was morally corrupt. Las Vegas had nothing on this city, right? It was the original sin city, earning it the term in the Greek vocabulary of the day that they would call somebody. If, if somebody called you a Corinthian, that was fighting words right there because they were describing you as being debaucherous or lewd or lasciviousness. And the reason that I spend the time to tell you this is because it's this crazy, messed up city that the Holy Spirit calls the Apostle Paul to plant a church. What does that tell us? For God so loved the world, right? The world, including those cities that are, that are uber messed up. And without uh, that brief overview, look at verse 1 in your Bibles. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 1. Paul, called to be an apostle of Jesus Christ through the will of God, and Sosthenes, our, our brother. I love this. Paul starts his letter with his credentials, that he is not a self-ordained leader. He is ordained by God, and he is ordained to be an apostle. Literally, literally, apostle means one who is sent out. In a loose sense, every Christian is an apostle, small a apostle, not one of the 13, right? Small a apostle, Paul being the last. So when somebody comes up to you and they give you their business card and it says apostle so-and-so, just say, oh, <laughs> Oh, did you see the Lord personally? Have you met? Did you? Because that was a requirement, right? When they were replacing Judas, it was one of the requirements. They had, had to have been with the Lord from the beginning. The Apostle Paul had his own personal uh, uh, experience with the Lord on the way to what? On the road to Damascus. Very good. On the road to uh, Damascus. There are so many men running around today giving themselves their own credentials, but they don't have credentials from the Lord. It's only a matter of time until they're exposed. Here's the application. Paul was called to be an apostle by the will of God. By the will of God. It begs the question, what are you called to do by the will of God? What are you called to do by the will of God? If you and I sat down together after church and, and I asked you that question, what would you say? What is the calling on your life? What is the specific calling that God has given you to fulfill your part in the body of Christ? See, I think that's one of the challenges that we have today is that most Christians are not doing what God has called them to do by His will. Could you imagine, could you imagine if every Christian on the planet actually put their calling above their hobbies, put their calling above their work, put their calling above, put their calling above the non-essential things that we spend time with. And, and we all do it, right? I'm just, I'm just saying it's not an either-or. If you're truly a Christian here today, you are not your own. You are purchased at a price. So you should want to know what your calling is. Your calling is not just to show up here on a Sunday morning. 
That's good. I'm glad you're here, right? Or a Wednesday night. But what are you doing to serve the saints? And especially here in your church, you should probably find your place to serve. If you're not serving anywhere, let me help you find a place to serve. We'll give you a spiritual gifts test. We'll see what your best fit is. But you should be serving on a regular basis, not just a little onesie, twosie. Well, I made a meal for a family that was dealing with a difficult time or hard. Well, that's good. Praise the Lord. That's hospitality. But a hospitality isn't something that you do once a year or twice a year or three times a year. Hospitality is something that you should be doing on a regular basis. Maybe be a greeter. Maybe be an usher. Maybe help Sylvia in the kitchen. Kitchen. Maybe, maybe help um, Annette over in children's ministry. Help Daniel in the media team. There's just plenty of places that you can be serving. And, and in 2024, maybe just stop giving God the Heisman. Um, what I, I know I can promise you that he has already had this discussion with you. I can promise you that. I'm just repeating what he has already told you, so I'm, I'm encouraging you. What are you doing by the, will of, by the will of God? All believers in Christ are called to something. That's why we read this encouragement. We read this encouragement in uh, 2 Peter 1.10. It says, Therefore, brethren, be even more diligent to make your call and your election sure. Are you diligently living out your faith, making your election into God's family sure, and are you living it out right now, what you are called to do by the will of God? Again, like I said, if, if not, let me help you. I want to help you get there. You will get a blessing. You will get a blessing from, from serving your king. In ancient times, they would sign the letter at the beginning, which is opposite of what we do uh, with letters today. Uh, this epistle, epistle, and just so you know, an epistle is not a wife of an apostle, right? An epistle, an epistle. Yeah, I went there. Um, an epistle, it just means letter. That's all it means. It just means letter. This epistle is from the great apostle Paul and a dude named what? Who's the other guy? Sosthenes. That's a fun. Look at the person next to you and say Sosthenes without spitting on him. Say Sosthenes, right? Sosthenes. Well, Sos, Sosthenes, who Paul refers to him as a brother and apparently is a name he knew the church in Corinth would know. How would they know him? Because in Acts 18, there was a man named Sosthenes who was the synagogue ruler. You remember this? He was the synagogue ruler. And he actually brought charges against Paul for preaching the gospel. And here, if it's the same... Sosthenes, apparently he has come to Christ at this point, which is a testimony of the power to transform people from Jesus' haters into Jesus' lovers. Here's the application. Even those you know who are vehemently against Jesus are only one heart change away from being a lover of Jesus. So don't give up on them. Don't keep praying for them and continue to shine the light of Jesus in front of them. Look at verse 2. To the church of God, which is at Corinth, to those who are sanctified in Christ Jesus, called, what's it say? To be saints with all who in every place call on the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, both theirs and ours. So the recipients of this letter are described as saints. Extra points, if you know what the Greek word is, you know what it is? I put it on the screen for you. It's hagios, right? You've heard me talk about that before. Literal translation, holy, blameless, ceremonially consecrated. The Bible says nothing about calling people saints who are dead at least five years, supposedly did a miracle. You've talked to some people like this. Maybe you were raised in that environment. Voted on to receive the title of saint and then made into a little plastic statue that they can be placed on the dashboard of your car. No. No, there's nothing biblical about that at all. The Bible says that by putting our faith in Jesus, we become one of the Lord's saints. I think I'll change that on my business card. St. Gregory. What do you think? Okay? No? 
No? You don't think so? That's a hard no. I can tell. All right. I get it. I get it. Now, this saints theme is something that's going to be carried out through the entire book of 1 Corinthians. And in, uh, in his correction of their ungodly behavior, Paul is going to tell them over and over, you were called to be saints. You're not called to be an ain't. Because that's all there is. There's two different kinds of people in the world. There's, there's, there's those who ain't got Jesus and there's saints who do. There's nobody who's almost a Christian. Either you do or you don't. And Paul says that they are called. Called to what? They're called out of the dark into the glorious light of Christ. Paul also says that they are sanctified, which means to be set apart. This word is what was used to give definition to the vessels that were used in the temple. You understand what he's, what he's doing here? Because each one had a specific use, just like every believer is set apart for a specific use. Look at verse 3. Grace to you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. Grace and peace, that was the typical greeting of the day with grace being the Greek word meaning, meaning favored or accepted. And peace being the Jewish greeting meaning what? Shalom, peace, right? Just shalom, peace. Verse 4, I thank my God always concerning you for the grace of God which was given to you by Christ Jesus that you were enriched in everything by him in all utterance and all knowledge even as the testimony of Christ was confirmed in you so that you come short in no gift, eagerly waiting for the revelation of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will also confirm you to the end, that you may be blameless in the day of our Lord Jesus Christ. That's a, that's a mouthful right there. I am usually the king of, of run-on sentences. That's 90 words right there of run-on run on sentence. And Paul comes out of the chute reminding the church that Grace is a free gift from God. Grace cannot be earned. It is given. He says that the believer in Jesus is endued, empowered with access to all knowledge and spiritual gifts. And our excitement of those truths should lead us to be eager for the uh, eager in our expectation of the Lord's return. If you knew the Lord was going to return today at uh, at uh, 3.05, five minutes after I finished the sermon. Um, just kidding. But if he was coming here at 3.05, what would you be doing for the next couple of hours? Number one, you'd be repenting. Number two, you'd be busy about the Father's business that you haven't been about up until this point, and you'd be occupying till they come. Well, Jesus could come at two or at one. Or at, I was looking at the clock, yeah. At, at 11.10, it could come in two minutes from now. Are you ready? Are you eagerly wanting the Lord to return now? Or are you saying, uh-oh, I got some things I got to get straight with the Lord before he, before he returns? Doing our best to know that we are positionally blameless leads us to put great effort into becoming practically blameless, living in obedience to the Lord, waiting for his revelation, waiting for his return at any moment. Paul continues, look at verse 9. God is faithful by whom you were called into the fellowship of his Son, Jesus Christ our Lord. Fellowship, it's that Greek word what? Starts with a K. Ends in oinonia, Right? Koinonia. And it's not just another word for hanging out together. It means to be connected to. And in the biblical sense, we are connected to Christ. Thus, we are connected to one another, to anyone who is what? Who is in, in Christ. A sign of growing in Christ is realizing that we need one another. Look at the person next to you and just say, I need you. Even if they're a stranger to you, just say, hey, I need you in my life. Every dude needs at least one wingman, one spiritual wingman in their life. And every dudette, raise your hand if you're a dudette. You're all dudettes, okay. You guys don't know? Did we just move our church to California? Did we? Okay. No. You do debts, you all need a spiritual wingman. You need a godly woman 
in your life who's not going to fluff you up, but who's going to tell you what the Bible says is required of us. God never intended the Christian to live their life isolated from other believers. That's why God says not to forsake what? The gathering together of the, of the brethren, right? Hebrews 10, 24 and 25. Can you read that? It's kind of smaller print. Read it with me. It says, let us what? And let us consider one another in order to stir up love and good works, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together, as is the what? Manner of some, but exhorting one another, and so much the more as we see the day approaching. Is, is that you? Do you see the day approaching? I recently watched um, the latest Buzz Lightyear movie. And like all guys, uh, all guys, I've always looked up to Buzz. He's a man's man. Look at that chin. Look at the chin. Look at the stern look. Okay, he's a doll. All right, that's, I just made that up. But, you know, he's just, a, he's just a doll. But in this movie, in this movie, Buzz had a cat, which greatly reduced my respect for him as an actor. Now, as unbelievable as the story was that Buzz Lightyear, this man's man of superheroes, had a cat, it wasn't just a regular cat, was it? You seen this? It's an AI cat. It's an electronic, it's an electronic cat. And when Buzz got in some troubling situation, this cat, this AI cat says, you're my mission and I am not going to give up on my mission which was completely unbelievable to me. Do you have a cat? you have a cat? If you have a cat, you know exactly what I'm talking about. A cat's mission is what? Itself. Itself, not others. Think about it. There's no seeing eye cats. There's no bomb sniffing cats. There are no police cats. I don't know. I have a question for you, and you know that I've thought about it, and I still might get a cat at some time, but, but, but I have a question for you cat owners. How do you know that your cat even likes you? I'm curious. Does I mean, how do you know? You don't know. You can't tell me anything. How many of you have a dog? All right. See? See, the dog owners immediately raise their hands. The cat owners are going, uh, yeah, I don't know if I want to admit it, right? How does your how does your dog react when you come home and he's been alone all day? He's excited to see you, coming right up to you, saying, I've, been, I've missed you so much. You know, little tails, you know, just going a mile a minute, you know. He, he, he says, let's throw the ball, let's throw the ball, let's throw the ball, you know. Sit down so I can jump in your lap. Here, let me lick your hand. Now, what happens when you walk in the door after being gone all day and you have a cat? Oh, you're home. Whoopee, right? <laughs> I'm going to go back and take my nap, but, but what I need from you right now is that you go open up that $5 can of gourmet little frisky salmon and shrimp, put it in my bowl, and when you're done with that, you need to change my litter box because that thing's beginning to stink, right? And before you do that, why don't you come over here so I can taste your hand? You know you have a cat and it licks your hand? He's not licking your hand like a dog licks your hand. He's tasting you. He's seeing if there's something better for him, you know, deep, a little deeper down. If you're a cat, people, don't get mad at me. I'm just pulling your chain. I will pet your cat. I will, if you pay me. I will pet your cat. I will pet your cat. <laughs> I'm trying to prove a point. I went a little wide for that, right? That is your cat, by the way. But what I'm, what I'm trying to do here is I'm painting the picture is that we all need some fellowship. Your cat doesn't feel like you need fellowship. Your dog does, and, and, and uh, you do. So, so you're going to go. You're going to go through some kind of trial where you're going to need a wingman or a wingwoman. Build some relationship. Have the attitude. Have the attitude for somebody that you care about enough in your life that, that you're my mission. I want to help you with your mission. And, and that's what I'm trying to do this morning. I'm trying to help all of you and those that are watching, you know, online right now. I'm trying to help you with your mission 
in being obedient to God. Do what you've been called. Do what you've been called to do. So the Apostle Paul, he's been very congenial and gracious with these people. He has a deep love and concern for these people, yet yet now what's he going to do? If you've read ahead, now he's going to get down to business of why he's writing them this letter. So after nine verses of praise and encouragement, pretty much the niceties are over, and Paul begins to get to the root of the matter because he knows that there is sin in the camp. Look at verse 10. It says, now I plead, now I plead with you, brethren. Underline that word, circle that word, brethren. Brethren. Why? Because he's talking to believers here. By the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, that you all speak what? The same thing, and that there be how many divisions? No divisions among you, but that you may be perfectly joined in the same mind and in the same judgment. How many times does the Apostle Paul use the word same? Count them. I've got some Skittles for the first person that raises their hands. How many you got? Who said three? Who said three? I, I still don't see any hands. You guys all blew your... I'm going to keep my Skittles myself. That's just... I'm going to pretend to be a cat. Okay. No. Three. Three is correct. In Paul's role and the authority given to him by God, he could have demanded that they do what he says. Yet Paul doesn't do that. Paul has a pastor's heart. And he sees how division is hurting the family of God. So so as a father, he pleads with them. He begs them, humble yourselves before one another. Because as believers, they're supposed to, we are supposed to have the what? The same mind. And what mind is that? The mind of, the mind of Christ, exactly. It's the mind of Christ. When it comes to desiring the mind of Christ, we have to make our brain like a, a human etch-a-sketch. Do you guys, have, anybody have an etch-a-sketch when they were little kids? Remember those things that you just shake up? You'd, you'd, you'd ride and then you'd shake it up. All of that was gone. I would love to shake up all that carnality that was in my mind before I came to, came to Christ. Just to cleanse us, you know. God's word is what he uses to cleanse us of our, of our old ways. So we must daily apply a healthy dose of God's mental floss. Get it? See what I did there? See what I did there? Mental floss. You know, it's like daily floss. You know, daily, you know, we use dental floss for our teeth. We need to floss our minds, and we floss our minds through washing of the water of God's word. So there in verse 10, how many divisions are there to be in God's church? Paul says there are to be what? No. No divisions. So if that's the desire of the Lord, why is it, why is it that every church you go to, there are divisions galore? This is an easy one. Starts with a P, ends in ride. Pride, exactly, pride. What would the church look like? What would the church look like if church people actually hated their pride the way God hates our pride? What would that look like? What would that church look like? What would the church look like if people actually chose humility when they have an opportunity to exercise pride or anger or What would happen if we exercised humility and self-control? Set a guard over our mouths. What would happen? What would happen if we actually actually did that? You know, in in 2001, my pastor did an outreach to New York City. And a a year after, it was like a year after the Twin Towers were destroyed in the terrorist attack. And, And one of the nights, some of us went to Times Square Church. You ever been to New York? You ever been to Times Square Church? Oh, You got to go. You got to go. Times Square Church, David Wilkerson was pastoring at the time, and it amazed me that 1,500 people showed up on a Thursday night 
for their weekly prayer meeting. 1,500 people showed up weekly for a prayer meeting. David Wilkerson, extremely humble man, he's the guy that wrote the book, The Cross and the Switchblade, right, about Nikki Cruz. And uh, he's also the guy that started Teen, Teen Challenge. Well, Pastor Wilkerson uh, died later, later that year in 2001. Another, uh, that incredible legacy, the baton of leadership, was handed over to a man that most of you are probably familiar with, a, a man named Carter Collin. Carter Cullen, also a very humble and Jesus-centered man, who once said four words that changed my life. Here's those four words. I encourage you to write them down. Pride makes us powerless. Pride makes us powerless. People often ask why, why God isn't working through his church the way he did in what we read in our Bibles, especially in the book of Acts. And I I think it can be narrowed down to just two things. There is way too much pride and way too little dependence on the power of the Holy Spirit in our lives. Most of the church today is operating without the dependence on the baptism of the Holy Spirit. Few Christians hunger for the the dunamis power we read about in Acts 1.8. Few Christians are willing to put into sacrifice uh, of just being a sold out and having a disciplined life that puts them in the position to receive this gift that Jesus says the baptism of the Holy Spirit is available to every believer. Every believer. Every true believer. From my experience of watching the men and women that God uses to do great things, humility and the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they go hand in hand. Seek those things out in 24. You're not going to grow. You're just not going to grow without without committing to make some changes. Look at verse 11. Paul has just dogmatically stated that there are to be how many divisions? None. No. No divisions. No divisions. Verse 11 says, For it has been declared to me concerning you, brethren, by those of Chloe's household, that there are contentions among you. Apparently, Chloe's family, someone in Chloe's family, maybe all of them, you know, they rat out the church of Corinth to the Apostle Paul, which in this case was the right thing to do. I almost titled this section, Saintly Snitches or sanctified snitches, because it emphasizes the fact that information rolls uphill. Information rolls uphill to the leadership. Leaders are required to know the condition of the flock under their care, including knowing the the contentions between the sheep. Wise leaders don't get involved in every little dust up between the sheep. We don't get involved with those, especially not right away, because... Because we need to give the Lord time to work it out. If you've got a little beef with somebody over here, go work it out biblically. Don't come to leadership right away. Humble yourself before that person. Humble yourself. If it's a sin, practice Matthew 18. If it's just something that you know you were offended by, make sure that you have an it is written. And if you don't have an it is written, if it's not a biblical offense, then it's no offense. You just let it go. What? Yes. Stop using the world as your barometer of how to act. Use this as your barometer of how to act. You're a, you're, you're a new creation in Christ. God's word needs to, to be first in, in all things. You know, if it escalates, yes, then leadership has to get involved and we will exercise our God-given authority, but, but so many things are they're worked out. You know, we're going to get some details on what the, the exact contentions were in the church of Corinth in the, next, uh, in the next weeks to come. Yet for now, in a generic sense, I will say this, most contentions and conflicts that church people have with one another are very petty. Can't you just agree with that? Aren't they, aren't they petty? 
I've been in ministry for over 30 years, and like every pastor with decades of experience, it breaks our hearts what people who profess to know God will fight and argue over, all while having zero problem neglecting one of the primary exhortations of the New Testament, which is to what? Love one another. It's hard to be mad at somebody when you're actually what? Loving one another. I was always taught that you, that you can't change what we don't identify, and the church needs to be honest here and to identify. When it comes to petty quarreling and contentions, church people don't seem much different than people in the world. I don't know if you, you read about this recently. Two neighbors, two neighbors in, in Minnesota, they made the front page news over a petty spat. Petty spat, right? Did you hear about this? Neighbor A dumps trash cans full of leaves over his fence into neighbor B's yard. Neighbor B enlists a couple of friends with leaf blowers to return the leaves to neighbor A's yard. And you guessed it, it's all captured on video. We'll feel happier when we are kind. Let's be caring, let's be kind. I put the music to it. Over the kind. fence here. This is hilarious. We'll this is the other guy. He's got his little leaf blower. He's trying to push all that back. There's his leaf blower. That just cracks me up. So much for good fences make good neighbors. Right? Did you see? Did you see all that? It wasn't just this pile here. Look at all these piles. That's some Hatfield and McCoy stuff without the guns. Right there. Does this kind of stuff, who's from Minnesota? Anybody from Minnesota? From Minnesota? Does this stuff ha happen in Minnesota all the time? You betcha. Right? <laughs> you betcha. It's love your neighbor, not leaf your, your neighbor. Sometimes you just got to let it go and leaf it alone. <laughs> right? You just, why do we get so bound up over these little things. You know, it's sad. Full-growed men. Full-growed men acting like little children. It's pathetic to see adults act that way. Is it? Do you, do you, agree? you agree? You agree? I'm setting you up. I'm telling you in advance. I'm setting you up, okay? So just agree because it's true. But to be fair, how much more pathetic is it to see professing Christians who supposedly have the same God living in their hearts quarrel and contend with each other over petty issues like, hey, there weren't enough hymns this morning. Hey, there were too many hymns this morning. Hey, we want this color of carpet and Bible translations and, and I didn't like what the leader said today or or, or did you see the children's ministry leaders attire or, or hats in the sanctuary or, or, or should it be tuna casserole or green bean casserole at the potluck? It's silly. It's non-biblical. It's non-eternal issues, non-essential issues. But church people go to war over that. It just, it's heartbreaking whenever. That's other people, not, not you guys. I'm sure that you guys have never dealt with anything like this. But other people. It happens at other churches. It never happens in ours, right? No, it happens everywhere. So, in closing, the Apostle Paul is going to identify many things in this letter that are still going on in the church today. And he's going to exhort us over and over and over. And I think the Holy Spirit will compound this as well. Stop sweating the little things right? Pull an Elsa. Just let it go. <laughs> Just let the little things go. If it turns into a big thing, if it's a biblical thing, deal with it. Deal with it biblically. But the little things, man, all, all it's doing is calling, causing anxiety in our lives, and, and, it's, and it's keeping us from loving one another the way that, uh, the way that Jesus tells us to. Amen? 
Amen. Let's pray.